a shadow of a doubt, that convoy was a peaceful protest. We proved that to the world. I want you to know that I am not afraid. In one of my first videos, I said how proud I was of all of you. So proud of you. You have come together in a way that I've never seen before. Just please stay peaceful. And please take care of each other. And know that this too shall pass. As human beings, we make choices from one of two places. We make choices from love or we make choices from fear. We can only win this with love. The hill of so many brave men and women, I can't tell you how amazing these people are. And they're going to stay and they're going to fight for your freedom as long as they possibly can. All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Way of the Truth Warrior. My name is David Whitehead. I am very thrilled to be doing this extra show for you this week. Today, it is Friday, October 21st, 2022. And we are trying to find out the truth about what is going on in my country of Canada, what went down with the trucking convoy that lit up Canada and the world and brought the spirit of freedom in a way that we had never seen before. And I've been covering this a lot on my show. I covered it during the convoy. Uh, I've just released a little documentary called The Truckers Were Right Because They Were. And um, today I have a very special treat. We are getting some updates from the ground in Ottawa by one of the legal counsel that is involved. Her name is Eva Chipiuk, and you can get her on Twitter. I've just retweeted her Twitter. It's for Eva Eva 79 and uh, she's co-legal counsel with, um, oh, let me just get the right, with Keith Wilson. And they are working on the Peckford Travel Ban Challenge, which we know the courts just threw out. We're going to talk about that. Um, she represented Tamara Leash and the Freedom Convoy. She's an advocate for rights and freedoms in Canada. And we've got this inquiry going on about the Emergency Powers Act that Trudeau decided to declare without any justification whatsoever. And we're hoping that that gets shown to the world as this whole thing unravels. We've already had a few good gems coming out of this inquiry, but I want to hear it from the ground. And uh, this woman is a true truth warrior. She's out there fighting the fight, and we're happy to have her joining me from Ottawa. So let me go ahead and bring Eva in. There she is, Eva. Thank you so much for taking time out of your incredibly busy schedule to jump on and give us this update. Welcome to Truth Warrior. Thanks. My pleasure to be here. And it is Eva. That's right. Eva. For Eva, Eva. <laughs> ah, that's right. I should have saw, I should have known my apologies, Eva. Oh, I love it. Well, um, let's get into it. What, what do you feel is happening right now? Maybe we'll start with the Peckford challenge. Cause that's fresh off the press. Everybody's talking about it. Um, the courts kicked him out. And I mean, he's one of the original signers of our charter of rights and freedoms. And yet the courts of Canada seem to know better than him apparently. So what's the update on that? Yeah, well, you know, that's the update. I haven't had a chance to really turn my mind to it, but it is, you know, without a doubt, disappointing that that's what the court has decided. I can um, let you know and your viewers know that it looks like all applicants are appealing the decision. Uh, it is, again, really disappointing to see that the court in would think that this is something that we don't have the decisions yet. So we've gotten a preliminary um, letter from the judge saying that just let it giving us a heads up that she's found that it, it is moot and that decisions will come. So I do look forward to those decisions, uh, the reasons of her dis for her decision, because that will help us understand what it is and why it is that she decided to rule this way. So it's a bit hard to comment right now, but it is on a preliminary like review. It's really hard for me personally to understand, me as a lawyer to understand, um, 6 million or so people's Canadians right to mobility, you know, just quashed. And at a, you know, just one day, the government decided Ah, uh, let's just suspend it, you know, and that's the whole purpose of the lawsuit is what was the justification 
And if we're not able to have that discussion in court, where do we turn from there? So, you know, I, it's really hard for me to even comprehend what happened and comment almost right now, because we, I felt, you know, I gave it better odds at one point, really my odds changed from the time we, we had the application and because we were getting so close to the hearing date, which was set for October 31st, I was feeling a little bit less optimistic. Um, and that's what came out of it. And it's interesting. I mean, we know that she, of course, is a liberal appointee and you start to wonder if they've sort of been having a meeting as all of this has been unfolding and kind of saying, you know, we got to make sure we can't let anything come out into the light. Do you think there's any kind of chicanery going on in the background? I guess you can't really comment on that, but uh, that's what I see. What do you think? Well, actually, I believe she was a Harper appointee. So oh, was she? Okay. That is my understanding. I, on t- To be honest, I hadn't researched that because, you know, as a lawyer, you have to believe that the judges are going to be impartial and unbiased. I, you know, otherwise, I, I don't know how I could go, you know, continue my job in, in good conscience and, and even advocate for people's rights. But from a preliminary uh, analysis, that's, that was my understanding. So um, I'm not sure if she is liberal appointed, but we can't hang our hats on that either in any event. Right, right. And it, yeah, you'd hope, I mean, that's what we're all hoping for is that the justice system actually works. It didn't really work with the truckers in the beginning or where we're at. I mean, we've got the inquiry, which is a good thing. I'm glad that's happening. I was kind of worried that wouldn't even, we wouldn't get to it, but here we are. We've already had some amazing clips going all over social media of some of these bombshells, you know, like the admittance that they broke the deal with the truckers uh, when it came to moving everything to Wellington, uh, that, um, you know, there was a whole bunch of other ones, uh, just the the way that some of these people being interviewed were acting on the stage and you know, pretending they only speak French and they can't understand the question. There's been a whole bunch of crazy things, but you're there. Uh, maybe just tell people your role, what you're doing there in Ottawa, and then what's your thoughts on the inquiry so far? So um, when the act was invoked in February, it's the Emergencies Act, and we've heard a lot about that Emergencies Act. And so I'll explain it a little bit because you mentioned I wasn't sure if this would go ahead. So in the act itself, there is a requirement that um, a commission be set up to investigate whether or not the federal government was justified in invoking the Emergencies Act under the circumstances. So it's legally required for the government to do that. So there was basically no option. It wasn't going to happen. And a lot of people before this was started were saying, oh, it might get delayed, especially if there's an election or this or that. And that was literally impossible. And unless they changed the law, which would make it difficult. The other component to it is that The commission is, uh, number one, doing an an investigation into the facts. So that's the first six weeks. And the last week is like a policy recommendation based on what they uh, heard for in terms of the evidence. Uh, With respect to my role, as I believe you know, and probably many of your viewers know, uh, Keith Wilson and I ended up being on the ground and working with a lot of the protesters, the Freedom uh, Convoy a Corporation, Tamara Leach specifically, Chris Barber. Um, so we were legal counsel for a uh, number of, you know, recognized protesters on the ground in Ottawa. Um, and it's, it was a once we got into this inquiry process, it was a bit of a unique role for us because not only were we their legal counsel, but we also were witnesses and active in a lot of what occurred and would be, you know, uh, reviewed during this um, inquiry. For example, the main thing being the agreement with the truckers to move to Wellington. And that was something that both Keith and I were very active and in working with the city and the police on. So we would we had to decide how we would approach this inquiry and how we decided to move forward is we made ourselves available to the commission and the commission did kind of requested at the same time to be witnesses so that we could present evidence. Um, And then at the same time, uh, the group retained Brendan Miller, who you now see cross-examining the witnesses and Bathsheba Vanderberg, who also was cross-examining today. 
So we've kind of split the roles as Keith and I are acting as solicitors. So that's everything behind the scenes kind of. And then Brendan and Bathsheba are doing um, the facing to the commission. So the standing up is how it, barristers stand in court and make arguments. So that's what they're doing. So we've kind of separated our roles a little bit so that we could make ourselves available to the commission in a different capacity. Well, that's incredible. And, and thank you for being there on the ground for during the convoy and, and now, you know, that's incredible. And uh, the amount of blowback that this has gotten along with the amount of support that it's gotten has just, it's divided the country, but it's also united the country. It's this weird thing, this situation that we're in. And I think people were trying to move on from it. And then now we've got the inquiry, which I think is a positive thing because it's bringing it back up. And I've been thinking that it's almost a better time to talk about to people about why the convoy even happened and what it was really intended for right now than maybe even during the convoy. Like the, the times have changed a little bit since then. And um, so, you know, we're all hoping that we can get some justice out of this or get some clarification or, or whatever. But how do you see the role of the inquiry in achieving that? Because uh, we all feel extremely angry as Canadians about what we've seen happen. Uh, we feel like it was egregious what took place when they sent in these green shirted thugs to uh, basically push around a bunch of peaceful Canadians. And there were many acts of violence that occurred, not by protesters, but by actually the police towards the protesters. This, of course, was ordered by Justin Trudeau. And, um, you know, he didn't even want to sit down with the trucking convoy who brought the science panel in with Dr. Byron Bridal. You remember the whole thing? And they didn't even want to have a conversation. So I guess a lot of us Canadians are going, when are we going to see justice? Is this a path towards that that justice or that exposure of the truth of what really happened? How do you see this inquiry in total in toward, towards getting to that goal? Yeah, well, I, I think that we're going to get there. And I, I've heard a few comments now. And your clip was excellent because and what you're asking is excellent. Why did we... Why did the truckers come here? Why were the protesters here? And there's been a little bit of discussion now. Well, we aren't really talking about that. But we, right now, um, the commission has really shown the, shone the spotlight um, on the city of Ottawa and the police. So on a local level. And if you've looked at the witness list, which seems to be how the commission is moving with um, the witnesses, it's looking first locally at the city of Ottawa, how the police respond. Uh, then it turns to the protesters and then the federal response. So it makes sense to me that we're kind of laying the groundwork first to get an understanding of what was going on on the ground locally, what police authorities were doing, how, how they were trying to manage uh, the protesters, what the protesters were doing, and then we're going to response uh, from the, the Fed. So I think that's when a lot of the bigger picture um, items that, you know, were the reason that, that the protesters came in the first place, that's going to come out a little bit later so far um this the first you know we can have a so sorry to interrupt you so sorry to interrupt you suddenly your connection just got a little bit finicky and it's just cutting off some of your words i know it's a hotel is always the issue yeah. right but um maybe what you want to try to do is just jump out real quick and pop back in and um if i could recommend i don't know if you have is this a, a phone or a laptop this is a laptop Oh, okay. Yeah. If you could use, I don't know if you have Chrome or Firefox, those are usually the best. If you jump back in, I could try my phone. Would that work? Yeah, we could give the phone. Sometimes that works. Okay. Very okay. good. Thank you so much. Awesome. All right. We'll give Eva, uh, Eva a moment to jump back on just so we can hear what she's saying. This is so amazing. I'm so honored. We get to have this conversation with her uh, because we hear things, right? We hear things, we see stuff on social media. I have people messaging me stuff and you never know for sure. So it's good to be able to talk to somebody that's on the ground. And just while we're waiting uh, for Eva to jump back in, let me just show you where you can follow her on Twitter and get more information about what her and um, her colleagues are doing. So you can get her here. You can also check out her website, Chipiuk Law. And that's uh, C H I P I U K dot C A. And you can get, you know, some more information about their legal firm and everything else and what they're doing. But just incredible um, what what has been happening. And 
I'm glad that we get to have this discussion. So let me just see. There she is. She's coming back in. Let's see if this is a better connection. Hey, Ava. How's that? Hi. Much better. Okay. Yeah. It, phones tend to do that. We ha I have the cell on it. If I. Okay, good, good. It might be a slight off, but we're going to do the very best we can. It's always fun with the hotels. Um, but so you were just talking about the inquiry, how you see it moving, um, what's going on in the background. It's good to see these testimonies being recorded and put out. And there's beautiful clips that uh, some of the media, alternative media or independent media is doing, which is great because we're proving a lot of the stories the media put out about it wrong. There were many things that were proven wrong, like how they were trying to paint all this violence that was going on, yet you have police testimony saying, I didn't, it was actually shocking the lack of, vi of violence. I believe that was the OPP commissioner. Um, and there was a few other golden nuggets that came out of it. What, what are some of the ones that stood out for you? And, and then, of course, continue your comments before we got cut off. Uh, you might have to remind me about my comments, but in terms of uh, um, how the media has played out is, you know, that was OPP Super Morris, who was the kind of, he seems like the in, top intelligence Ontario. And he was the one that said the lack, the lack of um, those charges. What he also said is that, that repeatedly he said that there was no threats. And at some point it seemed like, like the federal trying to push that issue a little bit and almost kind of a fish for, well, what about this? What about this? And no credible threats. And then speaking to what the media did, he said that what politicians and the media was portraying did not help caused, you know, problems with their enforcement. And they had, so not only are they trying to deal with protesters, on the, the ground, they now have, have this need to make people better informed information. That's what the role of some of these officers became. Good. That's not right. So it was I really interesting. I'm so sorry to jump on you again. It, it seems like you're breaking up once again here on the phone. I'm, I'm wondering if maybe we should just stick with the laptop. I'm really sorry to do this. I just want it. I'm good. Precious words are being cut off from you. <laughs> Can you still hear me? Okay. Let's just give her a sec. Sorry, guys. This is just the way it rolls. We're on the location. And Ottawa has a weird thing going on. Yeah, let's try that. Let's do this. Let's try that. Okay. Let's see how that goes. You can hear me okay? I can. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that sounds that seems a little smoother. Let's let's stick with that one. Okay. I I think um sorry to do this now to you, but I should I'm gonna just plug in my laptop too. Okay, no problem. No problem. Um and it still does seem to be breaking up just a little bit. Um we're going to do the very, very best that we can here. Maybe just make sure there's no other pages open or whatnot. Just bear with us, folks. I should, I got to get down to Ottawa. This would be better that way. <laughs> you should just go down and interview you guys directly. Okay, let's let's give that a shot, and we'll see how the connection works for us here. Okay, well, yeah, go ahead. So, so where we were was... Um, you were talking about the OPP. They were talking about how the media. Oh, and then there was Jim Watson, too, that was talking about how he got his information about these violent acts from media reports and that they had they never saw any of it or documented any of it. Like, I've got plenty of footage documenting that it was basically a giant love fest, but they don't seem to have a lot of documentation about all these violent extremists, uh, white supremacist Nazis running around. And uh, that's a problem because it seems like they were just trying to smear a very peaceful, organic, legal protest. Yeah, I, I don't have too many really wonderful things to add to the conversation about what Jim Watson had to say, Mayor Watson, um, especially after hearing his evidence. It was a lot of um, 
fiction over facts. So facts were coming from the, his city manager, facts were coming from his chief of staff who testified the day before as saying that the protesters were very reasonable. And one thing I do want to um, note is that it didn't come across, I think, during the evidence that how quickly the protesters and our clients came to a resolution with the city. So there was a, a very abrupt meeting on Tuesday, which, you know, just kind of came together. By Saturday, we had a deal with the city of Ottawa um, during this heightened, you know, a situation that everyone was in because the protesters were very clear and our clients did came here not to impact Ottawa residents. Had anybody had this discussion with these protesters before, with our clients before, I suspect they would have been very happy to do anything that they could to reduce impacts on Ottawa residents, but nobody brought that conversation to them. And then now this last week, what we've been seeing is uh, there was a disconnect between the OPP and the OPS about planning, about what the plan was, about whether there was a plan. And I feel like, you know, these poor protesters and our clients were kind of being ping-ponged between all these departments and police agencies. And and that's that's the issue because, you know, how are you supposed to protest the government if you disagree with them? The whole point of living in a free democracy um, is that we have the right to disagree with the government and then make our voices heard and have our disagreements discussed, right? And I keep coming back to when, when people challenge me on, on the convoy and everything, I just tell them, are you even aware that we had, there were many opportunities given to the government to just come out and have a conversation, right? Is that true that the whole point was to go there to be heard? That's why they were honking the horns. That's what it was all about was to go, we don't agree. Here's all the Canadians that disagree. And we want to have this conversation because I remember working before the convoy where I'm here in BC, where we were trying to go and do little local protests or meet and greets or send letters to our local MPs or our representatives, uh, get on the phone, talk to them, you know, and none of that stuff was working. It was just, you were just getting the door shut everywhere. So there was no avenue by which Canadians could go and and have a discussion about a disagreement. And that's why we started protesting. And then it turned into the truckers. And then we went and we said, okay, guys, we'll go home anytime you want. If you can bring Health Canada in front of these world-renowned scientific experts and show the justification for these laws. And they didn't even respond to these guys, let alone come out and have the conversation. So that's why it kept going. And, uh, and then we saw what happened. So I guess our hope is in the end, we could still make the government have this conversation with us and prove all the science that they keep talking about and prove the justification for declaring something like the Emergencies Act uh, about this protest. Um, so any comments on, on any of that? Yeah, lots. Um, I had a number of points I want to touch on and I'm sure I'm going to forget some of them. So I'm going to go with what I can recall. So number one, uh, I am going to touch on the Health Canada and talking to experts because I can tell, like, I don't think that was what everybody went for. And there was a bit of, you know, maybe misinformation is the right word to use there. And a, a lot of different people with different ideas of why they came to Ottawa. Um, you know, I don't think we should hang our hat on that issue. I think, and you started up with it a little bit and even talking at home is, who came to Ottawa? These are Canadians and they want to talk to their elected officials and they have the right to do that. They should be able to talk to their MPs, especially if they want to have a discussion about what they don't think is going right. There's nothing sinister about that. That is in fact their job. And when there was those discussions about, oh, so this MP or that MP went and took a picture or went to the protesters, and that was viewed negatively, excuse me, but that is their job to talk to Canadians, to talk to their constituents. If you look up the roles and responsibilities of MPs, it's exactly that. If they're not talking to their constituents and Canadians, what the heck are they doing? So I want to go back to that. That was my understanding. At least my clients came here to, to Ottawa to make their voices heard. One other thing you did mention about the horn honking, and I do want to address that because horn honking, you know, was a big thing. Many 
of my own clients didn't really advocate for that. Number one. Number two is um, many people think that the horn honking was a way to be heard. And you did mention that from what I saw and what I experienced, it was more of a joyous honk. Uh, particularly if you were walking the streets with Tamara Leach, our client, so you'd walk by, she would get recognized. And, you know, in unison and in joy, um, truckers would just blow their horns because they were acknowledging her and being happy. It wasn't to say, hey, we're here, listen to me. It was more like, yay, we're excited, we're here. And then just most recently, somebody sent me a clip of, you know, two little kids going into the trucker's cab and pulling it as they do. So this is something that's been a little bit lost. While, yeah, I'm sure there's some people that were doing it because they said, darn it, I've come here. We haven't been heard. I, and if you're not going to listen to me, I'm going to pull this horn. But from my own experience, I honestly didn't see it that way. I saw people doing it kind of rejoicing especially on the weekend when there were so many people and kind of the block parties everywhere. It was just part of the festival experience. I'm glad you brought that up. I, I saw the footage there as well. Um, and it, it definitely was that it was, it, it, there was a celebration vibe in the air the whole time. And it was just so you know, it was the same out here in BC. I was up every weekend for probably two months uh, at the legislation in Victoria with, there was thousands of people. I've never seen anything like it. It was just, yeah. I get goosebumps thinking about it. And that was just a little, this is the island in British Columbia. Vancouver was massive. Calgary was huge, all over the country. So e the protests weren't just happening in Ottawa. It was a countrywide. And there were people on the overpasses. There were people all over. It went on and on. And um, it was, a, it was the vibe was when you got there, it was high fives, hugs, people were blowing bubbles. It was, there was guys handing out warm apple cider, you know, like it, it was as Canadian as you could get. And yet you had all these people coming out to flip us off and, and call us racist and everything. And it was just, we had people from every race. Did, could you comment on that whole smear about the, like, what does that do for smearing millions of Canadians with this brush of racism and all this stuff when it was completely the opposite that? Where do we stand in the law or in this process with holding the media accountable for those slanderous comments about peaceful, non-racist Canadians? Well, I think I, I do hope that that's something that the inquiry will address. And it's already become, you know, pretty obvious about um, some of those name callings that it, it just Number one, the OPP, like I said, OPP Morris said this did not help in any way, shape or form. Um, the name calling and, and, you know, you said people are calling them names. It's not just anyone calling the protesters name. It started at the top. The leader of the country, the prime minister of Canada is it's like he's egging people on. I, I don't even understand why a, a leader of a country like Canada, which is, you know, meant to be diverse and and inclusive and just those words it doesn't it, if you have a different view that's exactly the point of di diversity and inclusion and i cannot even imagine what um there was a large c group here i'm polish background and i would hear po lots of polish people coming from communist poland um really helping and advocating uh lots of Chinese Canadians that said, you know, this is looking very similar to what happened in China. How do those people feel when, you know, they're already uh, discriminated against uh, and here your prime minister is calling you names? I just, I can't even imagine what these people feel. It's pure blind rage, I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> but, but it, you know, we're trying to channel it into something beautiful. That was what was a beautiful thing yeah. about this for me was that yes people were angry yes people lost their jobs they lost loved ones i didn't get to go to my i didn't get to have a funeral for my mother who passed away in the early on uh, due to heart failure and other complications um you know there was so many ways that our lives were destroyed by these policies and yet we hadn't heard a decent argument scientifically in canada about the justification for it 
um, we just heard them saying things like, well, we're, we got all the science to back it up, but we never really got to see it. And there were all these questions and then it just seemed like overreach in so many different regards. So that's where it started. Maybe the anger of like, Hey, come on, like what's going on. And then when it was about restricting specific aspects of the charter, um, you know, like our traveling or the ability to travel within the country without being detained at go, leaving the country, coming back, you know, like my sister-in-law, they got fined, you know, $12,000 for simply not downloading arrive can, um, and then, you know, just stuff like that. And so, but what was really beautiful about the whole thing is regardless of the grievances that people had, like myself and so many others, we go there and it was hugs, kisses, ponies, rainbows, kids running around, bouncy castle. It was like, and it, it actually shifted our energy. Like my energy when I went to the legislation in BC was like, I want to paint my face like Braveheart, you know, not physically or just, just metaphorically. I just, I'm, I can't res believe this has happened in my country. And when I get there, I'm like, drop the guard. I'm hugging people. I'm talking to people, just have an amazing time. And it actually brought the best out in me. So the movement actually helped me deal with my anger over the situation. And I've spoken to so many other people that feel the same way. And yet here they are continuing to egg us on. Like you say, it started from the prime minister. It went down to the other ministers like Freeland and other people. Then of course the media just went, the media, uh, something needs to be done about this. It's just absolutely horrible. The situation we're in with the media in this country, they should be ashamed of themselves. Um, but thank God we have independent media. Thank God we had all these Canadians with their phones filming what actually happened so that we can even have this conversation. Can you imagine we didn't have phones or film down there? They could have got away with branding it as something completely different and we would have no argument, right? So I'm really glad we were able to show them this wasn't about uh, hate. This was about love. Oh, yeah, 100%. And one thing I like, uh, I had it two points, but I've lost one already. Um, sorry. One, no worries. Uh, one that I recall, though, is, you know, when you, we heard the Business Association come in and they were talking on the first Friday of the, the inquiry, they were saying, oh, you know, there were some people that some businesses that lost money for the first three we, for those three weeks. Uh, you know, a lot of people, as we probably also know, is lots of pe lots of businesses right in that area gained a lot of business because what happens when, you know, thousands of people gather, um, they need services, they need um, food, they need th co their consumers. So here there was a huge group of people um, coming in and some businesses, instead of taking advantage, turn the other way. Uh, but one thing I just can't get my head around is that, you know, the protesters came here because of these restrictive COVID mandates and businesses were lost for two years. And in fact, they were advocating one of the, you know, um, the requests they made is to have financial support for businesses that lost. And here there's a big deal about three weeks of business losses when the protesters were like, what about the last two years? Let's let, let's have the government help out there. And so, you know, everyone could have been on the same page there, but it was, it was like a narrow focus, narrow minded about looking at uh, this group of Canadians that were just simply n not happy with what the federal government was doing instead of looking at the federal government to begin with. So yeah, I don't I don't know why they got vilified. Well, I do know why they got vilified so much is because the prime minister turned the conversation on them rather than himself. That's exactly what happened. And, you know, I was one of those people. Um, I, I lost my martial arts and fitness practice I had with my wife for a long time. Uh, I was actually traveling back and forth to Los Angeles almost every second weekend because I was involved with television with History Channel. I was doing I had a, a new career lined up that got stopped. Um, so I haven't had, I haven't had any return to normal, even though the mandates have been lifted because I haven't been able to resurrect my dojo business. I haven't been called back to Hollywood ever since. Uh, so this is what I do now full time. And I, so for the people in Ottawa that said, oh, we lost a little bit of business for a couple of weeks. I'm sorry. That's the price for freedom. Did you lose business during the BLM protests or any of the other protests? Like if we're going to get picky choosy here, let's look at the big picture and realize that millions of Canadians had their lives destroyed by this. And, um, and then that, let's not forget what happened after 
when they got kettled and beaten by these cops and kicked out of the city, nobody wanted to hear them. Then a bunch of them had their bank accounts frozen. They had their insurance pulled. They had all kinds of problems with that. Um, could you speak to that? I know uh, Keith has done some good videos on this. Um, what do you think about the measures taken through the powers that they enacted with this Emergencies Act? Oh, in, insane is a good word to put it. Right. Um, and just going back a little bit, because you did mention businesses were lost. And sure. I myself am in the same boat. I don't, I'm just putting that out there. But one thing I learned when I was here, and I could, I think maybe, you know, this helps understand why people were so entrenched too, is I met some people that lost their children because of it. So the, the courts were very um, pro-vaccine and if one parent versus another parent uh, decided against or for the vaccine, they lost rights to see their children. So I don't, I don't think that comes up enough because I heard from people that were here that said, why would I leave? I have nothing left. And I'm like, well, shit. I guess these people are staying here. And so, and the prime minister, you know, even provincial politicians, even municipal politicians, all of them need to th remind themselves that these are human people that are facing really, really traumatic things. And it was, I don't, I, still have a hard time understanding that this happened in Canada, that people have been disregarded so much and we've kind of lost the focus, lost the plot completely. And we're doing this name calling instead of talking to each other once again, like we should be. Um, we've become gotten into these bubbles or something and don't talk to other people anymore. But that's one thing that, you know, I think we need to keep reinforcing and reminding people this isn't about, you know, a little bit like a couple weeks of uh, discomfort. This is people really lost a lot um, in their lives. I'm getting emotional thinking about it. It's I've just had reams of people messaging me and emailing me and I've spoken to them. Um, we've all hugged and cried together and, you know, it, it, just when you go and see it, and that was another phenomena that I noticed is that the people that were, uh, not going down to see for themselves, even I even had friends that lived in Ottawa and they refused to go down and even look at it. But the people that did the people, there were people that drove down hours to go and just to see what, if the media was telling the truth or what was really going on. And there were all these videos started to come out on TikTok and everywhere else of Canadians that were really upset that they had been lied to by the media directly, that it was the literal opposite of the brush that was being painted yeah. and that the whole story wasn't being told. And so I just said, okay, well then that means people that do independent media like myself and so many other amazing Canadians out there, this is our job. I'm sure that's how you felt with you. You're like, well, if all the other lawyers aren't going to take this, then I'm going to do it. W was that part of what inspired you to take on this, this battle? Oh yeah, without a doubt. I I wanted to make sure that the whoever was here was heard. Um, I felt compelled to come here. I was so happy to get a call and come here as soon as possible. And then I didn't know what I was coming into either. I saw the news reports. Um, the it was impossible to get downtown, and we didn't have a hotel because we came a bit later uh, in downtown. So we booked a hotel outside of town. We're taking a cab into downtown and not one slight problem getting into downtown when we hear, oh my, we were getting ready for an hour drive into downtown thinking that that's what's on the ground. We get here and like we know now there was always lanes open. There might have been a bit of delay um, congestion uh, and delays in traffic during rush hour and things like that. But that is called rush hour and congestion. Um, but certainly there was no big issue with traffic and I, we were in a hotel outside of downtown, like I said, and in and out, no problem at all, getting cabs, no problem at all. So the fact that they keep trying to use this rhetoric and again, it's, this is fact over fiction. 
uh, the police authorities that we've had so far really are laying down the facts. And it's the politicians that the councillors we had from Ottawa, the mayor, that are still trying to perpetuate this fiction. Well, I think they're trying to cover their butts because we know the truth is coming out. It's unstoppable. And, uh, you know, it's a bad day to be a lying politician coming up real soon, I'm sure. But where are we? We've only got a few minutes left, Eva, and I knew you're busy, but where do you think the inquiry is going to start to go? We've got, I think it's six weeks, you said, followed by a week of sort of deliberation. Where do you think we're headed next? Uh, do you, I think Trudeau is going to be on the stand at some point, isn't he? That's what we were told. Yep. So there's a preliminary list of witnesses that's up on the website for the commission. And uh, like I said, what it looks like they're doing and makes sense to me now looking at it is laying down what was going on on the ground in Ottawa. So first it was Ottawa officials, uh, police uh, authorities. So we started with OPP, a little bit of OPS. Next week is all OPS, I believe. So heavy uh, with that. Um, so it's kind of it looks like it's going down the list then it'll be protesters, and then it'll be the federal government. So the responses to all of this, uh, looking forward to all of it, like I, I'm a bit amazed as to what the first week has brought. I uh, thought Same that, here. you know, really the protesters would be the ones with the targets on their backs. And so far, you know, they, from what we heard from the officials, like I said, the city officials that um, were negotiating the deal with them, they were reasonable and they understood they didn't come here to impact uh, Ottawa residents. They came here to end mandates with the federal government. Um, so, so far, it's been a very promising and good week. And, you know, I was here. Uh, I'm not a criminal lawyer. I we we were watched. We were around these lots of protesters every day. I never witnessed anything criminal. I think this is the point I was trying, wanted to make earlier is not only that protesters, a lot of these people were talking to the police daily, every single day, talking to them and negotiating with them, moving the trucks where they were being asked. So how did we get to where we got? There's such a disconnect and I, I encourage everyone to watch the commission because um, uh, Commissioner Rouleau, he gets to ask some questions at the end and it's always very telling when um, the person overseeing the decision maker asks questions. And I've noticed some of his questions were already, what was the middle ground? Did you ever talk to the protesters about how they could move their cars? Or, you know, it was, it was black and white, he said. Either they're where they are or they have to get out. And so it was really telling. And that's what I'm, you know, I didn't think about it as much. But really, that isn't, is something that there was such a big opportunity for the police to talk to um, the protesters. They were talking to them every day anyway. They were overseeing. There wasn't arrests being made because there was nothing illegal happening, in my opinion. And, and there were many that, so just to say, there were many yeah. Ottawa police that were amazing and they were high-fiving the truckers and they were saying, good for you. There was a lot of actual support within the police community. Certainly, yeah. And then even those that didn't support, there, there was nothing to go and charge people for. So mm. when did this become illegal? I don't even think it did. Um, so we're going to get, I think, into that a little bit more next week. But when you're negotiating every day and you think that you're doing the right thing, why are these protesters being vilified? And exactly. I, I really, yeah, I really hope next week that's what we're going to get to. Like I said, it's going to be the OPS next week and they're going to have to answer those questions. Oh, I hope they, yeah. And I've been, I've been so impressed. I think I was gearing up for a disappointment when I first heard the inquiry was coming. I was kind of like, oh, here we go. You know, it's just going to be another po pony dance and then we're just going to move on. But I've been impressed so far and we haven't even got to the good stuff yet based on what you're saying. Uh, I can't wait to see the the wave. So it's OPS and then it's the protesters themselves, right? They're going to bring some of them in. That That's going to add a lot of weight because this is going to be, I guess you guys have a good diverse group of people uh, that are going to come and, and testify there. So they've they've chosen um, it's on that preliminary list again. We've asked that they include more people, uh, even more diverse range. Um, so we're working on that still right now and hoping to get that resolved in the next few days.
Oh, that's great because these people need their voices to be heard. And, um, that's why I just can't thank you and the team and everybody that made this happen enough for your, just your heroes. You know, you've got nothing but love and support from us all over the country and anything that I can do or, or whatever, you just let me know, I'll get it out as fast as possible. I have amazing people all over the world, uh, that tune into the show and each country out there listening, you're all doing your protests. You're doing your thing. You've had your run-ins with the government over this stuff. We're all in this together, as they say. Uh, so make sure your eyes on Canada and keep supporting this movement, because if we get some major exposures here with this, uh, that can also show you guys in other countries how this can also be done where you are and we can unravel this from the top down. And that's the goal. So it might seem like a long fight. I'm sure we're not out of the woods yet. But uh, do you see any hope at the end of this, Ava? Do you have any parting words of hope for people that are kind of feeling despair at this moment about all this? Well, yeah, a hundred percent, you know, one thing that really came out is, you know, a, a lot of people came together and new friendships were made, you know, there's a huge group, like you said, supporters all over the world. That's hope. That's already a win. You know, there's been, you really found out who your true friends are and maybe you just weren't aligned with other people. But I, I think that this is just the beginning in my view. I love it. It's just the beginning and I can't wait to see what's coming down the pipe. Well, please keep me updated. Um, thank you so much for taking this time and anytime, if there's something hot you want to drop, you just let me know, I'll get it out. And I really, really appreciate it. And please pass it on to everybody, uh, from me and everybody else that's watching that. Thank you for this service. And we really look forward to seeing the truth coming out. So thank you for what you're doing, Eva. My pleasure. So nice to be here and happy to be back. Awesome. Awesome. Well, that's it, ladies and gentlemen, just a quick update. Thank you so much for jumping in. Please help me share this out as far and wide as possible. Uh, it does so much good for people to see that these conversations are happening. They're not happening on the mainstream media, but that doesn't mean we can't have these conversations. So help us get the word out. Thank you so much. And we'll catch everybody next time. Cheers.